people put all the saucy stuff on the things too. Uh, these handouts are all out on Blackboard. So well, actually, there you get to an extra copy. You paid your tuition. Yes. Well, you still get one, but we may have to repossess it. Well, I brought my checkbook. Hey, don't let me forget to pay you for the. Because I will forget. You can pay me too. I will. No. He doesn't do anything. I know. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, okay. Title of our course Strategic Cost Management. I think we used to call this advanced managerial accounting, but you know, strategic cost management sounds well, just so much more strategic, I, I guess. But this course is going to have primarily two halves. The first half of the course, we're going to deal with financial statement analysis. So, got at least one trained accountant in the room here, Mary Beth, and occasionally I masquerade as a trained accountant, so we'll call it one and a half. But here's the idea. In, in, in you guys' daily work, it's a reasonable expectation that periodically you're going to have financial statements come into your possession. You're going to have to use those for a decision-making purpose. So, can you get something valuable just by looking at a statement at the surface level? Yes. But, if you understand how the parts fit together, you can dig below that surface and get a whole lot more information. So, how do we fit financial statement analysis underneath a course titled Strategic cost management, well, there's lots of cost information in the financial statements. QED, that's all we need. So, the, the back story, uh, Wendy had already finished her MBA, but they were over in Europe on, a, on an international trip. And this is one of the afternoons and they weren't creating a, an international incident that they went on a corporate tour instead. Actually, we are filming. Forget that international incident thing. But they were at some corporate headquarters, and financial statements got passed out to all the Taylor MBA students. And Wendy looked around. Everybody was breaking out into a cold sweat. No visible shaking. But the cold sweat was obvious. And so it's like, you know, don't call on me. Don't ask me. I don't want you. So, we sort of decided that that was not a good thing. That if you guys are going to complete the Taylor MBA, we want you to be able to go out in the marketplace there, compete effectively. And if you are not comfortable working your way around a set of financial statements, that is going to put you at a disadvantage in a lot of situations. So, that is going to be sort of the first half of our course and your first two assignments, creatively titled Financial Statement Analysis Part 1 and Financial Statement Analysis Part 2. The second half of the course, which will take up starting with the February residency, that will be more traditional managerial accounting, but it will be much more broad than product costing. It will look at understanding cost behavior throughout the entirety of the organization. Now, if you've looked at the syllabus, which of course you all have, but the syllabus, if you've looked at the syllabus, those four, there, there's two assignments for financial statement analysis, two more for the management, managerial accounting side of it, that adds up to 80. You also get to read a book entitled The Goal. And for folks that have had this course previously, that has been, and I hate to say this, because it really didn't reflect well on me, it's been their favorite part of the course. Um, the goal is set a real 
live actual person that, that, that lived and worked up in Elkhart County, Indiana. And it's largely autobiographical. But it's basically cost in decision making in both his business sphere and his private life. And so what you're going to do, one assignment, you're going to read the goal, pick out five items that you found insightful, and then just briefly describe each item, and then explain to me how and why you found it insightful. So previous students have found that to be a very valuable exercise for stopping to reflect on their work career, their personal life, make evaluations, adjustments, what have you. So, so that's been well received. And then you've also got a 10% a assignment where we're going to look at a, a biblical view of, of organizations and cost and decision making. Like, really? That's in scripture? Yes. And we won't even really have to read between the lines too much to get that. So that, that, that's sort of a sort of a, a big picture, quick overview of what we're going to do. But our time's limited here, so we're going to focus tonight and tomorrow on those two computational assignments you're going to have to complete between now and when we get together in February. So let's get right into that then. There we go. Okay, the handout you've got there, first off, basically it's a, uh, not the most elegant model in the world, but it, it's showing you how five statements how five statements taken together, put together correctly, form one model. If you pick up an annual report report. That annual report along with a letter from the chief executive officer, you're going to have five different financial statements in that annual report. A beginning and ending balance sheet, an income statement, statement of owner's equity, and a statement of cash flows. Now, if you were to look at any one of these five pieces in isolation, are you going to learn something about the company? Yes, you are. But what if you're able to fit the five pieces together? Not there. So, the idea is, you guys have all put together jigsaw puzzles before. When you get all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit together, what do you see most clearly? The design that you're supposed to see. If you look at any subset of those pieces, can you get some idea of what the, the finished product is going to look like? Yes, but only a part. 
So that is sort of our, our chief insight for tonight. If you are going to access all the data that you find in financial statements, you have to understand these as five pieces of one model. Let me ask you another question. What is a model? I mean, I'm guessing if you guys are all like me, that's kind of scary, but we are all humans though. But as a kid, didn't you guys you know, put together models? I did a lot of model airplanes. You, know, you open up the box. First off, the picture of the box in the front shows you like a B-17 or a B-24. <laughs> Open up the box, and there's these plastic trees that have all the parts on. And you, know, you can look at a wing and it tells you something. But what did you want to do? You wanted to put all the pieces together. So, let's stick with that model B-17. Now, if you go over to the uh, Air Force Museum, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, where there's a group that flies around the country and brings a B-17 and a B-24, and I think a P-51 Mustang. They even come here to the Fort Wayne Airport every so often. But what if you've never seen a real B-17? So you've never seen it. But you've seen the model. If you've never seen a real B-17, but you've carefully studied an accurate scale model, do you have a real good idea what the real thing looks like? So, see, that's the chief test of a model. Does the model faithfully represent the real thing? So tonight, when, when I get done here, I'm going to drive back over to the hotel. Now, I'd always taken Coliseum over here from um, when I would drive up from Winona Lake previously. And, and Evan said, well, well, you can take this, um, what is it, Washington Township Road or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, Washington Center, which changed to like St. Joe Center Road. And, and now I've got a pretty good idea how to get back to the hotel that way. How did I get that? An MAP, a map. Okay, so I don't have to like speak in code. I mean, you guys, oh, scary questions. So that map is a faithful representation of the real geography of Allen County here. So you see, that is the key criteria for a model. So if that's the case, instead of a B-17, what about what about a set of financial statements? What do a set of financial statements, what are they supposed to faithfully represent? Financial size of the company. Exactly. Well, now more on that in a moment. More on that in a moment. Let's not jump the gun. The financial statements are intended to faithfully represent 
the financial health and status of an organization. Think about it this way. You've got some money to invest, and you want to invest in an auto company. So you've got Ford, Honda, and Toyota. Um, firms that have been bailed out by the government, I refuse to use in my examples. So, you know, Chrysler and Anna, GM, just pushed to the side. But you've got Ford, Toyota, and Honda. Now, you want to know how well are these three firms doing? Because all other things being equal, you want to invest in the firm with the best financial prospect. Now, if we did not have financial statements, if those weren't available, could you figure out how well Ford was doing financially? You could, but it would take some money and some effort. What you do, you'd go look up all the manufacturing locations that Ford has. You'd hire a bunch of private detectives. They'd go stake out every manufacturing location and do what? Keep a detailed log of how many shipments of raw materials are coming in? How many finished cars are going out? How many workers show up for each ship? You'd go stake out all the Ford dealerships. How many new cars come in and put on the lot? How many cars are driven off by customers? So you could, you could conceivably gather enough information on your own that you'd have a basis an evidentiary basis for what? Concluding how financially healthy Ford was. But that would be incredibly expensive, wouldn't it? And even if you could afford to do it, if you did all that work, how much help is that going to be to Samantha? Not at all, because that's your private information. So, after the, uh, the Great Depression, Securities Acts of 33 and 34. See, still a free country. No company is required to provide financial statements to the public. But if you want your stock listed on an exchange, a requirement for doing that is to do what? To provide financial statements to the public that are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principle, and then every year auditors have to come in and examine those statements to determine if they faithfully represent the real thing. But the, the standard form auditors report goes something like this. We want financial statements that fairly present what? Fairly present financial position and results of operation in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So, fair presentation, financial position, results of operations, another way to say financial health. Okay, so we get to the point that they're going to do financial statements. Why is this gap thing so important? What if Ford Prepare statements, makes them generally available. But Ford comes up with the Ford method for computing depreciation. Honda does the same thing. They prepare statements, make them generally available, but Honda uses the Honda method for recording depreciation. And you've already got a pretty good idea what is Toyota going to do. They're going to prepare financial statements, and they are going to use the Toyota method. And it's not just appreciation, it's everything else. So, we've moved from a world, you no longer have to hire all those private detectives. So that world has gone behind us. Now, all the firms out there are providing financial statements. But every firm is doing what? making up its own set of rules. So, before you can interpret the Ford financial statements, what do you have to do? 
you have to become conversant with four accounting principles. In other words, you have to learn that language. Same thing with Honda, with Toyota. Well, is that a better situation that you happen to hire the private detectives? Yes, but it still falls far short of what? Ideal. So that's where GAP comes in. For external reporting purposes, companies don't get to make up willy-nilly, very precise accounting term, what they're going to do. Okay, instead, companies are required to follow GAP. Now look what that does. All you have to do is learn one language. All you have to do is learn one set of accounting rules, and you can read any financial statements that are out there. Okay, well that's helpful. But is there a wiggle room in gap? Oh, it sounds like you've actually thought of that. <laughs> all things. They didn't have enough room on the tag to say one size fits all, but not very well. Which is basically what happened. Which is why there will never be a TV show called that 80s show, because the, the clothing wardrobe just would never work. Okay, <laughs> so, so if GAP was a one size fits all, it's real narrow, would it fit all three of those companies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it fit, but it wouldn't fit very well. So, different companies If our goal, if our goal remains if our goal remains fair presentation, then different situations require different approaches. The method for accounting for inventory for a grocery store that is necessary to get fair presentation is not necessarily the same method in accounting for inventory that will get us fair presentation here or here. So, if you were to sit down and start reading about GAP, you're going to find 
that there is a, a fairly significant amount of latitude that firms can, can navigate within. And here's the idea behind that. Our goal, it's fair presentation, because of the different situations, different approaches are necessary. That is why the latitude is there. But now, you're on a roll here answering questions this evening, so let's see if we can keep that going. That's the reason for the latitude. What do you think businesses, in fact, do with that latitude? Is the goal fair presentation or something, shall we say, more nefarious? I wanted to use that word today. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Samantha? I think they abuse it. Exactly. So, the fair presentation is the, the, the furthest thing from their mind. Instead, their goal is, how can I use this latitude? I don't want to make the company look as it actually is. I want to make it look better or different than it actually is. So here's what we end up with. Now we would never, ever, the Taylor MBA, teach and endorse following make you aware of the following to protect you from the scoundrels that might do such. program, but in MBA programs across the nation, you can actually take three credit courses titled Earnings Management, titled Income Smoothing, as if these are like, you know, goods that we're going to manage earnings. We're not going to fairly present earnings. We're going to manage it. Here's sort of the idea. You got time, you got earnings per share. Well, if you had that much that year, that much next year, you sort of see a little trend, right? Well, what if you determined that that year was going to turn out like that? Should be cause for celebration, right? Should. But, if next year is back, and this is a nice positive trend, if next year is back here, how happy is the market going to be after seeing this here last year? They're not. But, we could drag that down there. Mark would be happy here, Mark would be happy here. The whole world would be a happier place. What could be wrong with that? So, if you all are going to be intelligent consumers of the information in financial statements, something you've got to be aware of. There is sufficient, I mean, this is not fraud. This is working within what gap allows. Working within what GAP allows, you know, you can basically, if not put lipstick on a pig, you can come close to it, okay? And if you didn't grow up on a farm, I still think the metaphor will work for you. So you, you've got to be, you got to be, you got to suspect that. When you go in, don't go in and say, okay, well, I'm just going to trust them. Yeah, this is this is fair presentation, right? Here. No, professional skepticism. Now, how am I going to figure out if they're doing this earnings management stuff? Well, certain things you can look for. 
And some of those things you can look for, we're about to get to when we look at how the model fits together. Now, when you get done with the whole MBA program, don't, don't do this until that happens. When you get done with this MBA and have free time back, and you know, after being kept you know, busy for 16 months, too much free time can easily lead to trouble and stain the reputation of the Taylor MBA. So, there's a reading list in the syllabus just to help out with that. But there's a book called Financial Shenanigans. And it's kind of like, if this is a theology class, in theology, there are no new heresies. There's only a certain basic number of ways that you can misstate what Scripture says. So what there are is, there are no new heresies, there are old heresies repackaged. Same way, there, there's only a certain number of basic ways to go about misstating financial statements. And then they just get repackaged as the years go by. So that book, Financial Shenanigans, looks at the seven most common shenanigans, the seven most common ways of misstating financial performance. So that's the environment we have to work in. Well, I want a different environment. Well, when you get to Mars, they may have accounting there too. Um, do not report back, because by the time the information gets here, I'll be retired anyway. They won't care. Okay, let's see how we can, how the parts fit together. Now, when I get all done, it, it's going to look generally like this with the emphasis on generally. Okay, we break time up into year-long segments. And at the beginning of the year, we have a balance sheet. Assets, equal liabilities plus owner's equity. This is like, we got the Christmas holidays that Juan is here. Growing up in my household, the whole family would gather together in front of the Christmas tree for a family portrait. Now, take that once a year. You can compare Okay, this is Christmas of 2012, Christmas of 2013. Boy, Uncle Harold, 2013 wasn't a kind year to him. Or, nephew Kyle, wow, he's grown like a weed. I mean, how can you tell those things? A balance sheet is like a snapshot. A balance sheet freezes what things look like at a particular moment in time. The Alabama-Auburn football game. No rooting interest in the game, which is interesting to watch. You could, if you took a picture of the scoreboard, the beginning of the game, it would say Alabama, zero. Auburn, zero. If you take a picture at the end of the game, what was it, Auburn 26, Alabama 20, I think, something like it. But you know, it's like, well, this and this look different. And that's what a snapshot tells you. Doesn't fill in what happened in between this picture and this picture. But at least we've got snapshots that tell us what things look like here and here, and we know that something happened in between. So beginning of the year, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. End of the year, same thing. So there are two of our five financial statements. Now, we can divide 
our assets up. Long term current. We can divide our liabilities up. Current, long term. Now, at least the, the accountant in the room is saying, current assets are listed first. I know. But I need these two together for my picture to look wonderful. So yeah. bear with me. And then owner's equity. We can break that up into two parts. We've got contributed capital and retained earnings. The CC, contributed capital, the RE, retained earnings. Okay, so what is it a little bit of the balance sheet tells us? Have you ever really thought about this? I mean, I know you've thought about, you know, what's the meaning of life? And, you know, who's going to make it to the Super Bowl? And why aren't they going to allow tailgating at this year's Super Bowl? And is it going to snow at this year's Super Bowl? I mean, I know you've thought about those things. But what about this? What is an asset? Ponder that one lately? Okay, assets fall into two general categories. My dad's a farmer. Raises corn and, and soybean. He used to raise pigs until he got old. And then, no more pigs. Still eats corn, but somebody else has to go with So, he's got tractors, a combine, a bunch of wagons, planner, tillage tools, and some other stuff I probably overlooked. All those things are assets. What is it? Let's take one particular tractor. Let's take his 986 international tractor. What makes the 986 an asset? Every year when he goes about planting a crop in the spring, and harvesting a crop in the fall. The 986 tractor provides benefits that help him in that quest to plant and then harvest a crop. So, one group of assets then are anything that offers benefits to the business. Now, this tractor when it was new, it had lots of years to give benefit. As it gets older, what happens to the remaining benefits? There's fewer and fewer of them until eventually what happens? The tractor is so old, it no longer offers any benefit to the business. Or, Dad still has a snowboard plow. Can't bear to cut it up. It is a fine piece of machinery but it's also obsolete. Because the moldboard plow used to also offer benefits, tilling up the soil, until chisel plows came along. And then nobody uses moldboard plows anymore. So the benefits, the moldboard plow didn't cease to be an asset because it wore out. It ceased to be an asset because technology changed and the benefits that used to be associated with it we're no longer there. So, one definition of an asset then. What makes something an asset? It will offer future benefits to the business. So using that definition of an asset, if an asset is anything that offers future benefits to the business, what is the value of an asset today? Wouldn't it be the, today is in the present, right? Wouldn't it be the present value of those future benefits? Now, that's 
just easy. We're not going to teach you time value of money in this course. But as a theoretical concept, that's that what makes something an asset. Now, as the future becomes the present, and those benefits are used up, you know what an expense is? An expense is any benefit used up in the present period. So those assets that represent future benefits to the business. What's another name for those assets? Expenses in waiting. Because as those benefits get consumed, the asset is gradually transformed into expenses. So that is one category of assets. All items that offer future benefits to the business. Another category of an asset would be cash or items that will become cash. So if you see something with receivable in the name, accounts receivable, notes receivable, be your two prime examples. What's eventually going to happen with the accounts receivable? the notes receivable, they will be converted into cash. So another category of asset that is cash or items that will become cash. Now, what makes an asset current versus long term? A current asset is cash or anything that will be used up within the next year. Long-term assets are assets that are going to take longer than a year to use up. Now, I could send you out on a scavenger hunt right now, but it's dark and none of you are wearing reflective clothing, so therefore we can't. That spoils all the fun. But here's the deal. If I sent you out on a scavenger hunt, and I said that it would put you in like groups of two, Bing, bing, bing. The first group back with an unowned asset wins. So if you went out and were looking for an asset that nobody owns, nobody owns it, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, you can keep it for yourself. But what is this here? Little old equal sign tell us. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. So, down here, these liabilities and these owner's equity, they are ownership claims on all assets. So what that tells me is this equal time tells me there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between assets and ownership claims on those assets. Which says that your scavenger hunt would not be successful. Because if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, you're not going to find an asset that doesn't have some sort of an ownership claim. Our house down in Brownwood, Texas. It's an asset. What kind of bed what makes it an asset? Not because it's brick, not because it has like a shingle roof. Not because the grass needs mowed. It's because the Wimbler family does what? We consume the shelter benefits that the house provides. So even our house fits that same definition. The value of the house today is the discounted present value of those shelter benefits the house is going to provide for us. Okay? The house we We don't own the whole thing. We have a mortgage. Mills County State Bank, very financially conservative bank, needed no bailout money from the federal government, has a mortgage. So they have an ownership claim on the house the Lumler family lives in to the extent of what? Their ownership claim. And then we, the Lumler family, we have a residual claim for the remaining ownership interest. So, one way to look at a liability then 
is an ownership claim on assets. How is that ownership claim typically satisfied? How do most liabilities typically disappear? And do not say bankruptcy. Okay, that may work in Detroit's case, but we don't want that to become the norm. Okay, so how then, this side of bankruptcy, how do most liabilities disappear? When you're liable to someone, does that mean you're sort of like obligated to, do, to them to do something? Typically, what are you obligated to be with regard to liability? And over cash. Okay? But, Steve looks like a classic car man. And so he's restoring 69 Camaro. Okay? Yes, it is. Excellent year. First, my first car is a 72 Chevy Nova. Why is it? 307 V8 automatic on the collar, but I almost bought it. I almost bought it. A 69 Chevelle SS, 396. Four speed on the floor, dual exhaust. I mean, you think about starting this thing up and it probably burned up gas. And I've regretted that's That's my one regret in life that I did not buy that Chevelle. <laughs> okay, but Steve is restoring not a Chevelle, but a 69 Camaro. Okay, he needs a carburetor. Goes down to AutoZone. Says, you guys got a carburetor for a 69 Camaro? The guy behind the counter, he's like just kind of normally, all of a sudden, his eyes light up, his countenance gets bright. He's like, wow, oh, muscle car. <laughs> you know, it's like, I haven't had much cost for one of those, you know. Since, since the Kennedy administration, actually it wouldn't be Kennedy because he died before 69. Let's see here, that would be, yeah, that Nixon fell. Never did like him. That's why I probably, you know, morphed to another president. But anyway, yes, we can get you one. But it has been several decades, several decades since we needed one. So here's the deal. You have to pay the cash in advance. No pun intended, you advance all the money. So you, you fork over the cash. Now, what's just been created? Well, the moment you give the cash to Advanced Auto Parts, a liability has been created. Advanced Auto Parts is now obligated to you, but they're not obligated to give you just mere cash. Because, I mean, shoot, you know, the Federal Reserve can print cash if there's no tomorrow. You want something more special than that, more valuable than that. You want a carburetor for a 69 Camaro. So how is that liability going to be discharged? By specific performance, by delivering what was promised. So, liabilities come in two forms then. Some are satisfied through the transfer of cash. Some are satisfied through specific performance, usually performing a service or delivering a product. Current liabilities are liabilities that will be satisfied within the next year. Long-term liabilities take more. Okay, the owner's equity is the leftover. The contributed capital this is what the original owners contributed to the company when the stock was first issued. So if we're looking at Ford Motor Company's owner's equity section, if Samantha, if she buys some stock from Steve, okay, but that stock was originally issued in 1925, it doesn't matter what you two pay for the stock here in 2013. Back in 1925, when Samantha's great, 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 great grandfather bought the stock from Henry Ford himself. That's what shows up in contributed capital. That's what the owners contributed to the capital of the company. Retained earnings. Why do we call it retained earnings and not total earnings? Because we don't retain the total amount. See, retained earnings. Begin in retained earnings plus income. And this is another thing, it's called the synonym game. Not cinnamon, that's what you put on your toast. But the synonym game. Two words that have different words but have the same meaning. Earnings and income are accounting synonyms. We do that just to confuse people, really. There's no other reason for it but that. So, beginning retained earnings plus income for the period, but we don't keep all the income. Some of it is distributed to the owners in the form of dividend. And that gets us to 
ending retained earnings. Now, this year income, income, sometimes as I get older, I'm going to do this once and never be able to get back up. And you are saying, not tonight. See, all of those things, those four components, go into computing income. Revenues and gains increase income. Expenses and losses decrease income. Now, what is it that differentiates a revenue from a gain? I'm a flower shop. I sell a dozen roses. That's a revenue. I'm a flower shop. My delivery van is old. I need to get a new one. I sell the old delivery van for more than my undepreciated amount for it. I have a gain. So why would I have a gain on the sale of the delivery van and a revenue on the sale of the roses. I'm a flower shop. What is a flower shop in the business of doing? Selling roses or delivery vans? Roses. So, revenues and expenses come from normal business operations. Gains and losses happen outside normal business operations operations. Why does that matter? You say, well, just, you know, if it's a plus, it's a plus. If it's a minus, it's a minus. You know, just, just be done with it. Well, what if you had a company with bottom line income of $50,000, but they had a gain of $75,000? See, if I don't label gains and revenue separate, I lose that. But if my bottom line income is $50,000, and I had a gain of 75000 in the mix. Now remember, a gain is what? A gain is not part of normal operations. That tells me my normal operations operated at a loss. Well, that's not a good thing. So that's why we want to keep those things separate. So we've got beginning balance sheet is one financial statement. Ending balance sheet is a second financial statement. And hidden, almost in plain sight, is a third financial statement. And that would be right here. Statement number three is the income statement. Okay? So far, so good. Now, contributed capital. What could happen here? Well, what if we issue some new stock? Contributed capital is going to go up. What if we retire What if we retire old stock? Contributed capital goes down. Now, there's two ways we can handle this retiring stock stuff. If a company buys back stock, but thinks there's a chance they might reissue it later, once they don't want to cancel it, then do they? So they call it treasury stock. Because did you know in some southern states it's still illegal to own yourself? It is also 
You can't, and as, you can't own yourself. So if, if, if Ford buys back Ford company stock, you can't put that in the asset section of the balance sheet. You should look at accounting Yahoo. And he wants to look like that. So you may see an account called treasury stock. Down here in owner's equity. What's, what's going to be the dead giveaway of treasury stock? It's going to have a negative balance. That's when a company buys back the stock and doesn't cancel it. If they buy it back and cancel it, then the amount of contributed capital is just reduced and we don't have any treasury stock. Okay, now, we've got a fourth statement up here then. And right here, statement number four. That is the statement of stockholders' equity or owners' equity. Now, if you were taking this class up through the mid-80s, We'd stop there. When I was an undergraduate, a statement of cash flows did not exist. Of course, neither did a huge national debt, but that's another topic for another course. Okay? We had something called the statement of changes in financial position. That event, I got my bachelor's degree in December of 82, started working on my doctorate in the fall of 84. By 85, 86, so you're right about the time of my Iran Contra, uh, sometime right in there, the statement of cash flows not only came into being, the statement of cash flows became the most important financial statement out there. We have a big old empty spot right here in the middle. Statement of cash flows is going to help fill it. Okay? So, long-term assets. We could purchase new assets. Or we could dispose of existing assets. Now, I always tell my introductory students this, never abbreviate assets, it's a cause of embarrassment. I want you guys too, okay, I mean, you're sharp, you figure that out. But, <clears throat> what's going on up here? We've got a name for all of that. In statement of cash flow speed, Those are called investing activities. Here's sort of the idea behind that. If I appoint you manager of a company, and you say, where's my assets? I'm like, assets? Assets? You don't need no assets. I mean, it's kind of hard to generate income without assets, right? A farmer. The more land you have, the more income you're going to generate. If you've got a factory and you produce stuff, the more assembly lines you have, the more stuff you're going to produce. So, these assets are what make it possible for companies to generate income. That's where that ratio, return on investment, comes from. The numerator is what? Income. The denominator is assets. Ties the two together. Okay, well these assets here, they don't just grow on trees. So then your long-term debt. We can issue new debt. Feel free to abbreviate that however you want. Or we could retire old debt. Now,
that and notice transactions in long-term debt and transactions in common stock on the dividends, that is all considered financing activities. Second part, statement of cash flows. Third section, statement of cash flows, is operating activities. And that's up here with current assets and current liabilities. Here's the idea. Revenue minus expense. equals income cash received minus cash paid equals cash flow. Okay. Do you suppose that revenue for the year exactly equals cash received for the year? Now, so if the two aren't equal, we need something to take up the slack. So you see, do you ever think about I mean, accounts receivable? It doesn't really get the attention and the appreciation and so richly deserves. Okay, accounts receivable. What is accounts receivable's purpose in life? Without accounts receivable, would we be able to recognize a revenue before the cash is received? No. See, if you're in a cash basis system, there's no such thing as accounts receivable in a cash basis system, is there? So accounts receivable, without that, it's a very important thing. Without accounts receivable, revenue could not happen before cash is received. Now let's go back, Steve, to your carburetor. Unearned revenue. It's a liability. Without unearned revenue, I could not record the receipt of cash before the revenue was earned. Because over here, What's the key of that in receiving cash? Cash come in or not? What's the key of that in a revenue? It has to be earned. How do you earn something typically? If it's a product, what's the key of that to earning revenue or a product? Deliver the product. What's the key of that in earning revenue with a service? Performing the service. Same idea down here. What about expenses and cash pay? What is the likelihood that expenses for the year are going to equal cash pay for the year? About the same likelihood as revenues equaling cash receipts or the Cubs winning the World Series and IU winning the Rose Bowl both in the same year. Okay, so in other words, really, 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 really low. Is when does an expense happen? The, the technical term is we record an expense when it is incurred. Okay, well, how many of you have used the word incurred in a complete sentence in a normal conversation in the last month? Okay, now Mary Beth's an accountant, so she doesn't count. Okay, Scott, are you an accountant too? Okay, so, but do you like, you know, talk to your significant others that way? Yeah, well, sweetie. If I forgot to take the trash out, would I incur your wrath? Yeah, we probably, I mean, unless we're doing like, you know, Shakespeare in English, we don't, don't talk that way. So, what would be a common sense then for an expense happens not when it's incurred, but when the item is used up? So, electricity expense happens when kilowatt hours of electricity are used up. Fuel expense, diesel fuel for the tractor, happens when. Diesel fuel is used up. 
Wage expense happens when employee labor is used up. So I think a better word to use, and actually have to hyphen it, but an expense happens when something is used up. So if I did not have the account office supplies, an account that again doesn't get the depreciation it should, office supplies allows me to do what? to buy office supplies today, and remember those supplies represent what? Future benefits to the business. Then sometime in the future when the supplies are used up, I record the expense. Utilities pale allows me to use electricity up right now and pay for that electricity I've used up later. So, non-cash current assets and current liabilities then, they serve this primary purpose. They take up the slack. Non-cash current assets and current liabilities is what allows the revenue to happen when it's earned. And that does not have to be the same time when the cash is received. So it allows the expense to happen when the item is used up, which does not have to be the same time as when the cash is paid. And that all together is operating. Activities. So there in blue, you have the three parts of the statement of cash flows. Operating, investing, and financing activities. But take a look now. I mean, in some sense it looks like a jumbled mass, but I think prefer to think of it as a thing of beauty. What you've got here is you've got five financial statements. And as we've talked through these five statements, what do we see? How well those five statements fit together as part of one model. So if you are going to glean all the information that's to be found in a set of financial statements, what do you have to do? You have to understand how the parts it together. See, a company is under pressure to meet income targets, have a difficulty moving product out the door. So what if it lowers its credit standards? Okay? So Brad, we'd always sell to you, but your next door neighbor is kind of shady. So, you know, we wouldn't used to sell them, but we've lowered credit standards and now we will. So a company lowers credit standards. That allows revenues to go up. Because they're selling to folks they would not normally have sold to. Okay? Well, if you just look at the income statement, you're going to be like, this is like cool. We hit our earnings targets. But your neighbor that is kind of suspicious about, okay? I'm not going to say which neighbor for right side of the street. I'll let you fill that part in. <laughs> you know, you, you'll have the, the Sydney confessor. But here's the deal. By lowering our credit standards, are our cash collections going to continue to come in at the same pace? Two-letter word begins with an N and ends with a vowel. <laughs> Man, you got it! Very good! Very good, he got it, man. It's like accounting humor. And after 10 on a Friday evening, when I, I, that is something. Okay, so now or no. Okay, so how would we figure out something was amiss? See, they're not going to put on the bottom of the income statement in big red letters to hit our income target. We had to like lower our credit standards so low that, you know, we could feel, you know, like, you know, Chinese takeout, we dig in the hole that deep in the ground. Okay, now they're not going to say that. But what's going to happen? 
Accounts receivable goes up every time a sale is made on account. Accounts receivable goes down every time we collect cash on account. Well, the, because we lower standards, those sales on account are coming in, but are the cash collections keeping up with them? No. So what's going to happen to the balance in accounts receivable? It's going to start growing. So if you look at sales revenue by itself, you're missing important stuff. You gotta look at sales revenue relative to account receivable. Those are the kinds of things, the kinds of insights we want you guys to be able to glean by understanding how the parts fit together. So that was our mission this evening, was to make, some might say be labor, that one particular point that a set of financial statements is five parts of one model. For that model to do the best job possible in faithfully representing financial reality, we have to understand that model is five parts that fit together well. So, where we will take off tomorrow is our, our phrase for our next session together tomorrow is something like the following. T accounts are your friend. Okay? Because we are going to use T accounts to help us analyze how those parts fit together. We will do that at sort of an analytical level. Then the Robbins Boutique assignment, their example, will hand that out and work through that. And that's going to set up your first assignment, Bauer Manufacturing. So for the Bauer Manufacturing data, your first assignment is going to be to compute cash flows from operating activities. Then your second assignment will be cash flows from investing and financing activities and selected financial ratios. But we'll sketch all that stuff out tomorrow. So our work for this evening is done. You've been a very attentive group, very much appreciated, and I'm sure that the backs of your heads will look incredibly wonderful on camera. So you know, be sure to watch the video and verify that yourself. So, and, and again, try not to tell him. I mean, his content can't help it. It just can't measure up to accounting. I mean, he, he's got, you know, the stuff he's got to work with, don't blame him. He's doing the best he can with the content he has to do. My job is really pretty easy. Okay? So, thank you much. We'll reconvene tomorrow.
there was a blank 